Good morning and welcome back to the Monday Study Group. We are in the book of Ecclesiastes now and we're dealing with chapter 2 today. Let's begin with prayer. God, we pray that you would lead us with your wisdom that is the guidance of your Holy Spirit that we might value things that have lasting significance and be able to sort out the lesser from the greater. May your will be done in our lives, and we're thankful for your love. In Christ's name, amen. So uh, chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes begins a section in which the author of Ecclesiastes, we also call him Koheleth, uh, or the teacher, I think as the uh, NRSV does, uh, in which he... Uh, decides to test out certain things to see whether they are meaningful, if he can get past his preliminary judgment that everything is mere vapor, everything is mere breath, everything is mere a chasing after the wind, all is vanity. We discovered that he presents his conclusion right away at the opening of chapter 1 and we'll see that he is going to try some certain things here in chapter 2 to see if they fare any better than his overall uh, assessment was in chapter 1 so we'll follow uh, his narrative he is still in the persona of King Solomon again we have very good reason to believe this is not actually King Solomon but is somebody who is writing uh, in probably the 5th or 4th century uh, before Christ, after the exile, uh, and perhaps uh, even in Jerusalem uh, after the time of the return from the exile. But again, no, none of that is certain. Nor do we know the actual identity of this author other than that he is a part of one of the wisdom schools that existed and that produced books like Job, uh, Proverbs, this book, the Song of Solomon, Sirach, and the Wisdom of Solomon, just to name a few, the most prominent ones. So chapter two, uh, and I want to say a word here at the outset about uh, translations. We are translating, you and I are reading translations of the Hebrew or Masoretic text. This text comes to us from the Middle Ages, but has been uh, verified, that's probably too strong a word, but uh, has been reaffirmed as uh, useful, valid, um, accurate, uh, by the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which contained fragments or copies of all the Old Testament books except Esther. And there have been fragments of Ecclesiastes discovered. And a general conclusion that was drawn by Old Testament scholars after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was that the manuscript of the Hebrew Bible that we had been using since the Middle Ages was very much like the trans was very much like the Hebrew Bible that was being used uh, in the time of Jesus and before uh, with some exceptions uh, there have been there were multiple versions of the Old Testament available both in Hebrew and in Greek but the text that we have been using is the standard Old Testament text. Translating Hebrew is different from translating Greek, let's say. Uh, it's different in that in translating Greek, we have much more of a sense of the detailed meaning of the author by the use of adjectives and uh, modifiers and prepositional phrases and so forth in a way that is a bit different from Hebrew. 
Hebrew is more abstract, at least in my view. Hebrew is more abstract, and it is a bit more difficult to ascertain a kind of exact meaning uh, than it is when we translate Greek uh, into the various translations of the Greek New Testament. That's just my own assessment. Uh, those of you who know Hebrew may disagree with me about that, but I find Hebrew more abstract and therefore more open to variation in terms of how it should be translated. So do not be surprised if you're using multiple translations that they don't agree word for word with each other, but the general sense should agree, even though the wording that a particular author might use or translator might use varies. Some commentaries that you may be using provide their own translation. That is, the writer of that commentary, uh, very much like Roland Murphy in the Word Biblical Commentary, provides his own translation of the Hebrew text. If you're using multiple Bible translations, which you can do, you know, <coughs> by going, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, BibleGateway.com. BibleGateway.com, I think, is probably the best general source for multiple translations of the Bible and also for study helps. Many of the study helps are available for free, but some of them you have to pay an annual membership for, as I do, in order to get more commentaries or more uh, word studies and other things that help you go deeper. It's not very expensive in my view. I think it's quite affordable, but again, that just depends on how much you think you're going to use it. So uh, don't be surprised that translations vary. Some commentaries are built on a particular translation. The uh, translation that we've recommended by uh, in, by Elizabeth Hewweiler, who is the translator in this series. Now, this series has been bought out by Baker, so your cover will be look will look different from this. This is the original that came out, and the whole series was purchased by Baker Publisher, and they put it out just as it is, but under a new cover and a new series called the Understanding the Bible series. But Elizabeth Hewweiler's translation uh, isn't her own. She is, as, in, as is true for the entire series um, published by, now by Baker, is based on the NIV translation. So in New International Version is one translation you may be using, the R NRSV or the Old RSV, the King James, the New King James, um, the uh, New Living uh, Version. Uh, there are many fine translations and because of the way in which it's possible to translate the Hebrew in a variety of ways, you may find that um, your translations won't agree with each other closely word for word, but the general sense should be, um, should be the same. All right, that's enough on, uh, for now on translations. So I would like to uh, read for you from Roland Murphy's translation I have a particular interest in Roland Murphy. Uh, he was my one of my uh, advisors for my PhD work at Duke in biblical theology. Uh, I did a, several courses with uh, Roland on the Old Testament, particularly the wisdom literature, um, and did an oral exam uh, as a part of the preliminary exams to begin to write a dissertation. And, and so I have a deep appreciation for the work of uh, Roland Murphy. So here is uh, Dr. Murphy's translation of verses 1 to 11. And, and while I read this, I think you should try to follow along in your Bible or whatever translation you're using. So verses 1 through 11. I said to myself, come, try out, and partake of good things. 
uh, that is also vanity. So that's like another preliminary conclusion, but we're going to go on to explore trying out, um, trying out joy and partaking of good things. And, and so now verse 2. So of laughter I said madness, and of joy, what can this achieve? I explored in my mind how to refresh my body with wine and my mind always leading on with wisdom and how to get hold of folly till I could see what is good for humans to do in the limited number of days they live under the sun. Verse 4, I did great things. I built houses for myself. I planted my vineyards. I made gardens and parks for myself and I planted in them fruit trees of every kind. I made reservoirs of water with which to irrigate a forest of flourishing trees. I acquired slaves, male and female. I had servants who were born to the house. I also had a flock of cattle and sheep, more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Verse 8, I gathered for myself silver and gold, the wealth of kings and provinces. I had for myself singers, male and female, and the delights of mankind, many women. I became great and I flourished more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stayed with me. Remember uh, in 1 Kings, Solomon had prayed for wisdom and God gave him wisdom as a gift and he said that now here, that as this person is taking on the persona of that Solomon, he's saying that his wisdom stayed with him. Verse 10, nothing that my eyes desired did I keep from them. I did not refuse my heart any joy. Rather, my heart took joy from all my toil. That's, that's going to be important in our chapter today. He says that he did not refuse his heart any joy, and his heart in fact took joy from all his toil. That was my portion from all my toil. Then I turned to all my handiwork, I think that refers back to everything he has said in verses 1 through 10, I turned to all my handiwork and to what I had so actively toiled for, and he looks at it all, and he says, Ah, all is vanity and a chase after wind, and there is no profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, there is no profit under the sun. So that's Roland Murphy's translation. I'm going to go back to using in our comments the NRSV, but I thought it would help to get a sense of how different well-informed translators uh, might, might translate the Hebrew text and how that compares to what we are using uh, in, our, in our Bible study. All right, so when we met this morning in the in-person group, um, two of us, three of us, read our translations. Some are using Robert Alter's translation of Ecclesiastes. Um, but uh, we read it out loud to get a sense of the passage as a whole, verses 1 through 11. And then we asked ourselves, what general observations do we have about verses 1 through 11? Rather than going verse by verse, let's just talk about verses 1 through 11, but to focus on general observations that we had. And I can remember some of them, uh, and I want to share them with you who are um, watching these videos online. We noted that... Uh, he is trying to find some kind of satisfaction. And he keeps testing things to see if that thing he is testing will provide the satisfaction or contentment that he is looking for. And you would think, at least some people would think, that he should be satisfied if he has all the money that he wants, 
all the pleasures of life, external pleasures that he wants, all the wisdom that he has, that he should just be satisfied with that. And people would think, hey, if I had what this guy has, I would be content. I would be satisfied. But you have to ask yourself, is that really true? This writer is telling you that he had all that and it didn't provide ultimate satisfaction or contentment or shalom. Maybe that's one of the functions of this book of Ecclesiastes is to say you may be tempted to think that you can find ultimate satisfaction and contentment and peace by having all the money that you could possibly ever have, all the possessions you could possibly ever had, all the experiences of the flesh that you could possibly have, of the body, sensual experiences, and it still would not provide contentment and satisfaction and peace. At least that's the testimony of this impersonator of Solomon. He maintained his wisdom throughout all this, so I take that to mean that he still has the ability to assess what's going on, even though he has wine and sexual experiences and multiple possessions and the beauty of nature and it, and all that it provides he still has the wisdom with which to assess the experiences that he's going through and that wisdom tells him that none of this is lastingly valuable and that would come as a surprise to modern materialist, capitalist people, whether rich or poor, who think, because, because many poor people think that if they were just rich, they would have contentment and satisfaction. And many rich people think they just need a little more and they would be satisfied. But this guy's saying, no. Uh, at least in his experience, he had everything that money could provide. It still didn't produce the kind of satisfaction that he was looking for, something more lasting. I also think that it's curious here that he says, I did these things for myself. Uh, I made myself vineyards, planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I made myself pools of water. Slaves gathered myself silver and gold. It certainly points to a very individual and self-centered search for satisfaction. I don't think we ever hear about his family here. You might also get the impression in reading Ecclesiastes that this is a lone and maybe lonely individual. We don't see much social interaction going on. We don't see a sense of marriage, family, companionship, friendship. He seems to be a bit of a loner and he isn't thinking about the possessions he has and the accumulation of possessions in a way that benefits other people. I don't see him deeply embedded in a social situation, but you may be reading this differently. Well, think about it. He seems like an isolated individual on an individual quest for what is ultimately satisfying. And other people could be used 
for his ultimate quest, slaves and so forth. But he seems to be using both things and people in order to gain the answers that he wants. And using people, usually in our experience today, using people doesn't ultimately satisfy. It's a lack of respect for other people. But why isn't that sense in Ecclesiastes so far? All right, verses 1 to 11, let's go on. So, verse 12 through 17. So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what can the one do who comes after a king? I mean, kings are supposed to have everything. So what could, what could exceed that? Only, he says, what could one do that comes after a king? Well, only what's already been done since I've tried everything. Then I saw that wisdom does excel folly as light excels darkness. And he then quotes a proverb, the wise have eyes in their head, but fools walk in darkness. In other words, the wise take advantage of the eyes that they have because they walk in the light. But fools who also have eyes in their head, but you wouldn't think so, he says, because they seem to be walking in darkness. But I perceived that both the wise and the fool result in the same fate. I, I perceived that the same fate befalls all of them, the wise, including himself, and the fools. And then this caused me to say to myself, verse 15, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. Then what was the value of being so wise? And I said to myself, oh, this is also meaningless, vanity, mere vapor, not worthwhile. This isn't what I was looking for. I thought maybe wisdom, which certainly does exceed foolishness, I thought maybe that would be the answer, but it seems as if all wisdom does is raise questions and doesn't give one the answers to what is ultimately of value and satisfying. And this is particularly true because death comes along and applies itself both to the wise and the foolish. I thought there was also a clue about his quest here in verse 16. For there is no enduring remembrance of the wise or of fools, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How, how is it possible that the wise can just die like fools? Oh, so I hated life. That's a temporary conclusion. He said he enjoyed life earlier. Now... He's having a bad day, and he's come to this conclusion that he will have, there will be no remembrance of him, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, this fact that the same fate comes to both the wise and the foolish, and there is no remembrance of us by, the, by those who come after us. Oh, all this is mere vanity and a chasing after wind. That conclusion again in verse 17. But I thought it was interesting that what he seems to be looking for, at least in this section, is some kind of lasting reputation or memorial of himself. We have much more of a chance in our day to leave a lasting memory of us by writing things, journals and autobiographies, and we can post videos to various social media or other internet accounts, and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren could 
look at these videos. In fact, this video that I'm making might still be on YouTube when my grandchildren have children and I'm dead and gone long, but they would be able to go back and see what this fool is saying about Ecclesiastes and Acts and Psalms and all the other things that we've done since COVID when we decided to make these videos available to a wider group than just those who can meet in person. So our author seems to be looking for some kind of lasting satisfaction through being remembered. And typically in the Old Testament, you're in, especially in those majority parts of the Old Testament that don't have hope for life after death, which is the most of the Old Testament, you get your lasting memory through your successors, through your children and your grandchildren, and that the memory of a good person would last. Memories of bad people also last. Um, sometimes we remember the worst people and have kept them in memory because they teach us important lessons about how not to live and whether we actually listen to those lessons and learn from them so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past is still an open question. All right, verses 18 and following. And so I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun. Well, earlier he said he enjoyed his toil. Remember back in verse 10? I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in my toil. And this was the reward of my toil. So he did find pleasure in toil earlier in chapter 2, but now he says, in light of the fact that he has to, that, that death is going to put an end to both the wise and the fool, and to the hardworking person and the lazy person, he says, I hated all my toil which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that, or because, it looks like I must leave it to those who come after me, and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. He doesn't seem to comment really here on his family. He just thinks that all the wealth he has accumulated is going to somebody else. And as was pointed out in our group this morning, if this is Solomon or somebody like Solomon, he had a thousand, seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. He's probably got a lot of kids out there. So which kids are going to have priority? And are any of them wise? He may not even know his children, it was said this morning. He may not even know who they are. He doesn't seem to have a sense of passing on all that he has gained through his wealth and toil to those who can be entrusted with these things after he dies. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Yet they will be the master of all for which I worked hard and used my wisdom under the sun. Oh, this also is puff of wind. And so, in light of that, I turned and I gave up my heart to despair. I'm not finding answers to what is ultimately satisfying and would bring contentment and peace and meaning. I'm looking for meaning. And so far, all I can say is it's not working out. I gave up my heart to despair concerning at least all the work that I have done under the sun because sometimes the one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill and done the best that they could must leave it all to be enjoyed by somebody who didn't do a day's work for it and who will use it unwisely and this also is a vanity and a great evil. And we were quick this morning to give examples of our own lives 
going back to neighborhoods we've lived in that have now deteriorated and the people who came after us were unable for some reason to take care of the property that we had tried to take care of and maintain and repair and paint and keep up the lawns and the gar and the grounds and if you drive back through the neighborhood it may not even exist the house i grew up in in troy michigan i remember the time when i came back to visit from another state where i was living then came back to visit the property that i had grown up on through elementary school and junior high school and high school all the way through my educational years of uh, pre-college and the house was gone it had been torn down my bedroom was no longer there the basement i played in was no longer there that house was torn down and a clinic had been built there the cornfield where we ran through the fields and picked corn and participated in the harvest and uh, enjoyed the fall seasons when the crops would be brought in was all gone and there was a church in the back part of the 11 acre property that I grew up on and the barn was gone the barn where we had played in the hayloft so many days the whole barn had been torn down and all that was left was some of the cement and the foundation. And I looked at that and I said, there's nothing left here of me except this maple tree that's at the foot of the driveway. Beautiful, large, old maple tree that I remember enjoying the shade of. And that's all that was left. Not, not that what replaced it was bad. In fact, what replaced it was good a clinic and a church. Those could be good things. But I also remember a neighborhood I drove through in Flint, Michigan, where I used to live when Michelle and I were at the Presbyterian church there, and I was the pastor of that church. And that neighborhood had declined seriously because of drug problems and poverty and a lack of education and all of the and racism uh, all of that participated in the deterioration of that beautiful little green neighborhood that we used to live in and I saw that this also is vanity and a chasing after wind what do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun well that's a good question what did you get from all the toil and strain with which you have toiled under the sun. And I'll bet you can name a number of very good things. Our author is not able to. For all their days are full of pain and their work is a vexation. And even at night their minds don't rest. He can't even have a restful mind. A contented mind satisfied mind. This also is mere wind, mere vanity. And so he concludes, there is nothing better for us than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in our work. This also, I saw, is the way God wants it. It's from the hand of God. Verse 24. For apart from God, who can eat or drink or have any enjoyment. So he sees God as the one who provides all the good that there may be and all the pleasure and enjoyment and wisdom that there might be. For to the one who pleases God, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. So he's acknowledging a kind of gratefulness for what he has received because it is from God. But he also says there's a kind of arbitrariness here. For to the one who pleases God, and how do you do that? How do you live a life that pleases God? Has he given us any information about that? He's tried a lot of ways to find personal meaning and satisfaction 
But I don't think until this point he's raised the issue of how do you live a life that pleases God, which might have something to do with other people. For to the one who pleases him, God gives all these good things, but to the sinner, the text probably should be translated, the one who misses the mark, to the errant one. Maybe it's the equivalent of the fool. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering everything and keeping it all up, only to be given to the person who pleases God. So you can do all that work, and if you are an errant person or a sinner, one who misses the mark, you don't even get to enjoy the fruits of the work that you have done because God gives it to somebody else who's more pleasing to God than you are. Crazy, crazy, he says. This is vanity. This is crazy. This is unfair. This is meaningless. It's a mere chasing after wind. And that ends our discussion of chapter 2, uh, we still haven't found ultimate satisfaction if we've been identifying with this author. He's trying various ways, and he's telling us what hasn't worked for him. What would work for him? Well, let's keep pursuing our study of Ecclesiastes. Maybe in chapter 3, he'll have a better answer.